In this video, we're going to look at planetary habitability, uh, the conditions required for a planet to support life. Now, uh, an immediate difficulty in this discussion is that we don't know exactly what forms life can take. We only know of one instance of the emergence of life, that is, life on Earth. Uh, life as we know it is carbon-based and uses water as a solvent. Now, perhaps an alternative biochemistry is possible, but we do have to start somewhere, and uh, it's best to start with what we know. So, for this reason, uh, astrobiologists usually think about habitability in terms of the availability of uh, carbon and uh, liquid water. Uh, now, an interesting recent proposal from Peter Ward and Donald Brownlee is the rare earth hypothesis, uh, which proposes that the conditions required for complex life are extremely rare, uh, perhaps to the degree that the earth may be the only planet in the galaxy that hosts complex life. Uh, in order for complex life to emerge, a whole host of factors are required that are all individually improbable. Obviously their combination is therefore uh, extremely improbable. Uh, now in this video we're mainly concerned with hab habitability for life in general, whereas the rare earth hypothesis concerns specifically complex life. Um, indeed, uh, Ward and Brownlee uh, hold that simple microbial life is probably abundant, that it's fairly easy for life to arise. The problem, according to them, is the step from microbes to a complex biosphere with multicellularity. Still, as we go through this video, uh, it's worth keeping this hypothesis in mind. Hey, uh, how probable is it for life and then complex life to emerge? Um, as we think about the conditions required for habitability, it's worth asking whether uh, this rare earth hypothesis works. Okay, so how do astrobiologists uh, think about planetary habitability? Well, one of the central concepts in astrobiology is the circumstellar habitable zone. This is the region around a star where the temperature is such that surface liquid water is possible. Too close to the star, uh, it's too hot and the water is vaporized, too far away, it's too cold and the water freezes. The range of the habitable zone depends on the spectral type of the star. The primary way of classifying stars is what's known as the morgan keenan system, which uses the labels OBA a F G K M. Uh, the the classic uh, mnemonic for remembering this uh, is O oh, be a fine girl kiss me. Uh, now this can be seen as a temperature sequence. O stars are the hottest at about forty thousand Kelvin. M stars are the coolest uh, at around uh, three thousand Kelvin. Uh, for stars in the main sequence, which is the mature stage of a star's life so it's after their birth and before they begin dying. Uh, this is also a mass sequence. Um, the main sequence O stars are the most massive, main sequence M stars are the least massive. The Sun is uh, a main sequence G type star uh, with a temperature of about 5800 Kelvin. Uh, obviously the hotter the star is, the further out the habitable zone lies. Um, this diagram shows habitable zones for different stellar temperatures, um, different stellar masses. I'll explain this tidal lock radius thing later. Uh, now, of course, whether a planet is in the habitable zone, uh, uh, whether a planet in the habitable zone can actually host water depends also on the atmospheric composition of the planet. Just because a planet is, is in the habitable zone, it, it could be too hot, um, due to greenhouse gases. Um, similarly, uh, atmospheric pressure affects the melting and boiling points of water. At lower pressures, water boils sooner. Uh, so a planet with a thick atmosphere will be able to sustain liquid water closer to the star than one with a more tenuous atmosphere. The situation here is also complicated somewhat by the fact that as a star ages, its luminosity gradually increases. When the Earth was formed, uh, the Sun was about 30% less luminous than it is today. So the habitable zone is gradually pushed outwards as the star gets older. Uh, in fact, the Earth is already on the edge of the habitable zone. Although the Sun will live for another 5 billion years, the Earth will move out of the habitable zone within only a billion years or so. So we, we actually have um, uh, perhaps a bit, less t a bit less time than you thought. Uh, we, we were on the, the very 
edge of the habitable zone and uh, as the sun heats up a little bit it'll push it out and uh, the oceans will evaporate. Now the classic uh, habitable zone is defined simply as a temperature range where liquid water is possible but there are various other factors facing specific types of stars. Stars much hotter than the sun, the O, B and A stars, emit proportionally more ultraviolet radiation which tends to degrade complex molecules. More seriously they have much shorter lifetimes. The hotter the star, the shorter its lifetime. The sun's lifetime is about 10 billion years. For a star only 1.5 times the mass of the sun, so this would be an F-type star, its lifetime may be only 3 billion years. Now bear in mind that it took billions of years for complex life to emerge on this planet. Microbes arose fairly early, uh, but complex organisms such as plants and animals have been around for only 600 to 700 million years. So uh, even for stars only a fraction more massive than the Sun, it's not clear that there would actually be enough time for complex life to emerge. As for the most massive stars, uh, the O stars, they may only live for a few million years, which in cosmic terms is the blink of an eye. That wouldn't be enough time for, for the planets to cool, let alone develop life. What about stars much cooler than the Sun? The main sequence M stars, uh, they're known as the red dwarf stars, and they're called that because they're relatively small and because they have a reddish colour, these are by far the most numerous stars in the galaxy. They account for 75 to 80% of all stars. And these stars can live for trillions of years, which is plenty of time for life to establish itself. Unfortunately, there are some severe challenges facing uh, any life around these stars. First, the habitable zone is extremely close. And this means that the planets would rapidly become tidally locked which means that their rotational period would be the same as their orbital period. So they would always keep the same face to the star. The moon is tidally locked to the Earth. It always keeps, it, it always shows the same face to us. And that's why you never see its features changing, because you always see only the same face of the moon. It's tidally locked. Now, in order to see why this happens, suppose we have a star and the planet close by. Now the star exib uh, exerts a, a, a gravitational pull on the planet. In particular, the gravitational uh, force on the part of the planet uh, closest to the star is stronger than the gravitational force on the part of the planet further away. And this introduces these slight bulges, which is shown here. I mean, obviously the effect is exaggerated here, but uh, you know, the, 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 you get these 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 bulges, and if you suppose that the planet is rotating, as in this case, then what you're going to get is that the bulges are always slightly out of alignment with the pull of gravity, and that introduces friction. And this tidal friction uh, slows down the planet's rotation because this bulge is sort of being pulled back. So it slows down the planet's rotation. Eventually, the planet slows to a stop, and you have just the same face facing the star, and this is tidal locking. Tidal locking creates the obvious problem that one face of the planet will be extremely hot while the other extremely cold. Now there are uh, a couple of options available for life uh, in these circumstances. First, it seems at least possible that you might have life uh, on, on the edge of the planet between the hot and cold face. Maybe conditions uh, on the edge might be more clement for life. Uh, another possibility is that the temperature difference might be mitigated by a sufficiently thick atmosphere that can allow heat, fl heat flow around the planet. Uh, now one thing to bear in mind in this case is that on the hot side air would be continuously expanding so you'd, you'd essentially have a very powerful low pressure system on the hot side while on the cold side air would continuously sink a powerful high pressure system. This would result in hellish storms, essentially a global hurricane. So life would be possible, but it would they, they, they would not be uh, it would not be pleasant. A final option, though, which seems quite plausible, is that it's not the planet on which life evolves, but a moon orbiting the planet. Uh, if you if you had such a moon, it would get 
more even energy from the star as it moves around its planet. So in, in that case it wouldn't really matter if the planet was tidally locked. So perhaps this problem of tidal locking can be uh, avoided somewhat in the right circumstances, but there are other difficulties with these low mass stars. They, they also tend to be much more violent than the Sun. Any nearby planet would be exposed to powerful ultraviolet radiation, uh, powerful solar flares, coronal mass ejections and so on. The proximity to events like solar flares would tend to ionise the atmosphere, degrading it over time. Even worse, uh, low mass stars are highly variable in luminosity. They can produce these gigantic flares that can uh, almost double their brightness in minutes, uh, which would tend to destroy the atmosphere, would be extremely dangerous to life. Any planet in a, in a close proximity to a low mass star would need a very powerful magnetic field in order to protect it from, from the star's violent activity. The problem here is that magnetic fields are generated by the motions of liquids in the planet's core, and if a planet is tidally locked it would rotate relatively slowly and so would probably be unable to generate an appropriately powerful uh, magnetic field. So for all of these reasons, astrobiologists tend to focus on uh, F, G and K stars as the more suitable abodes for life. Uh, so that's the, the, the circumstellar habitable zone. Now, there are a few objections to this concept. First of all, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, it's clear that if life can have a radically different biochemistry, well, the habitable zone may be much, much wider. Water freezes on the surface of Saturn's moon Titan, but it has lakes of uh, liquid methane and ethane. Uh, Titan is actually the only body in this, the only other body in the solar system that has lakes. And some people have suggested that uh, a form of life might exist on Titan that uses these hydrocarbons as a solvent rather than water. Now, this is this is entirely speculative. We uh, we don't really have much idea of this kind of life might be like, uh, if it's possible at all. But if life could survive on Titan, if there could be life with a totally different biochemistry, then obviously the, the habitable zone would uh, extend out much further. Uh, another problem for the traditional habitable zone concept is the potential for subsurface oceans. Many moons of the outer solar system have subsurface oceans. Uh, for example, it is believed that Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter, has an ice layer perhaps uh, 30 kilometers deep, and then below that an ocean of liquid water. Uh, this is supported by gravity measurements, magnetic measurements, geological changes observed on Europa's surface, and uh, various other pieces of evidence. Uh, the heat supplied to keep the ocean liquid comes from tidal forces, from the, the, the gravitational interaction with, with Jupiter. Europa could well be habitable. Um, obviously uh, life would not be able to derive energy from the Sun, uh, it wouldn't be able to undergo processes like photosynthesis, but perhaps it could be driven by geothermal energy, as we find with life around hydrothermal vents in the Earth's oceans. Um, there, are, there are subsurface oceans on, uh, on, on numerous moons, as, as far as we know, uh, so it could well be the case that actually uh, surface water is a relatively unusual habitat. Uh, perhaps most uh, most life in the galaxy exists in in these subsurface oceans. Uh, it, we we don't really we don't really know whether there's uh, whether there, there's life there, but it, they could potentially be habitable. Helmut Lammer and colleagues, in their article "What Makes a Planet Habitable," proposed a uh, useful classification of liquid water habitats. Class 1 planets are Earth-like planets where there is liquid water on the rocky surface along with sunlight. These planets uh, sustain clement conditions for billions of years, providing long-term habitability. We probably find them orbiting uh, G, F and K stars. Class 1 habitats allow for the evolution of complex multicellular uh, surface life. Class 2 habitats uh, begin as much the same as Class 1, uh, liquid water on the surface, but habitable conditions degrade, perhaps due to atmospheric escape or runaway greenhouse warming or 
stellar radiation or whatever. Life may originate in, on these planets, but it's unable to evolve in the long term into a complex biosphere. Although perhaps simple extremophile microbes persist in a few uh, localised habitats. Venus and Mars are probably examples of class 2 habitats. It's believed that these planets once hosted liquid water, but Venus soon uh, experienced runaway greenhouse warming, while Mars lost its atmosphere. It's possible that life still exists on these planets, in Venus in the, uh, the upper atmosphere, where temperatures are cooler, and on Mars in the deep subsurface. Uh, but certainly they are mostly barren now. Class 3 habitats are those that have subsurface oceans that contact silicates on the ocean floor. Europa is an example of this. Uh, below the subsurface ocean is the rocky interior. This is, uh, so the, the ocean is, is in direct contact with the rock, and this is important because this uh, may allow the ocean to become rich in minerals and it allows the possibility of geochemical recycling. In class 4 habitats, the subsurface ocean lies between uh, two thick layers of ice. Uh, Ganymede, the, uh, another moon of Jupiter, is a probable candidate. Uh, this class also includes planets with surface water above ice. The lack of contact with rock may make the development of life rather difficult, uh, although perhaps not impossible because material could be delivered by asteroid impact. So there are various different kinds of liquid water habitats, and obviously not all of these would be necessarily would have to be in the classical habitable zone. Um, of course, in practical terms, detection of life will be very difficult for anything other than class one habitats. The only way we really have at the moment of investigating life on exoplanets is by using biosignatures of their atmospheres. Atmospheric biosignatures are byproducts of life that accumulate in the atmosphere and can be detected by spectrography. When a planet passes in front of its star, its atmosphere will absorb more starlight at certain wavelengths, and this tells us about the composition of the atmosphere. Uh, so, the circumstellar, the circumstellar habitable zone concept is clearly limited, because it doesn't apply to class 3 and class 4 habitats. Uh, worlds within the habitable zone need not be inhabited, uh, they need not be habitable, and worlds outside the habitable zone may be habitable and inhabited. But from a practical point of view it, it still seems quite useful uh, to, to have this habitable zone concept since our focus in exoplanet research will be on class 1 habitats. We really have uh, no way of probing subsurface oceans even in our own solar system, let alone the oceans, uh, subsurface oceans of other stellar systems, uh, whereas we could at least in principle detect signatures of surface life on exoplanets. So let's look at a few other um, factors affecting habitability. Recently the concept of the habitable zone has been extended to include the galactic habitable zone. And this is a claim that certain parts of the galaxy are more hospitable to life than others. The centre of the galaxy is extremely dense with stars. The nearest star to the Sun is Proxima Centauri, about 4.22 light years away. In the galactic centre, there are about 20 million stars in a volume just 3 light years across. This would obviously be a problem for life because it means uh, that there's a greater chance of stellar encounters. If a star passed close to our, uh, our solar system, it would disturb the Oort cloud, sending a shower of comets towards us. And if the star got close enough, it could directly disturb the orbit of Earth, sending us uh, flinging towards the Sun or out of the solar system entirely. Even if a planet in the galactic centre managed to avoid these uh, collisions and encounters, the greater density of stars means there'd be a massively increased exposure to gamma rays, x-rays, more chance of nearby supernova and stellar collisions and so on. So it looks like planets near the centre of the galaxy are unlikely to host life. The same problems, though perhaps to a less severe degree, occur in the galaxy's spiral arms, which contain a higher density of stars. So we really need to be looking for stars that are outside the galactic centre and also outside the spiral arms and whose orbital velocity equals the rotational velocity of the spiral arms so, so that the stars 
uh, continually steer clear of a spiral arm. There are other constraints as well. As the distance from the galactic centre increases, metallicity decreases. I should note that in astronomy, everything other than hydrogen and helium uh, is classed as a metal. So you'll often hear astronomers say that a star or a galactic region is metal poor, and that means that it has relatively lower abundances of all elements heavier than helium. Obviously, metals in this sense are required to form rocky planets and life. Uh, we find that as we move away from the galactic centre, stars have lower abundances of metals. Uh, similarly, globular clusters, which are collections of stars that orbit the galaxy as, a, as kind of galactic satellites, they also exhibit high stellar densities and low met metallicities. So the best stars are going to be those in the galactic disk, uh, but that orbit in, in a band between the centre and the outer parts of the galaxy, where you've got that sort of just right combination of low density of stars, but high enough metallicity to support planets and life. A galactic type may also play a role. There are three types of galaxies, the spirals, ellipticals and irregulars. Elliptical galaxies may be less suitable for life because they tend to contain mainly low metallicity stars.